Good morning. Sorry, we're trying to get organized. <laughs> so glad to see all my church family here this morning. Glad to have all of you here. We have two guest worship leaders today that we're so thankful for. We all know Dan Sansbury, our native son, I guess I should say son-in-law, sort of, who's back with us today. And we also have on the piano Miss Sue Aceves. And she comes to us from Laurel Hill, and she was just friends with Debbie, played with Debbie there, and that's how she ended up with us today. So we're thankful for you, thankful for you that you guys are here. Um, it's our hope and prayer that you will experience God's presence and plan for you during this time. Um, also, as a reminder, please sign the attendance register on the pews and tear that page off when the offering comes by. I'd also like to mention that the flowers are placed today in loving memory of Woody and Helen Hamden by Miss Peggy Hamden Stewart. And I don't think there's any other announcements. We're glad that all of the children and advisors came back safely from Montreat. Mac looks a little tired. <laughs> and Mary Jane, yeah, they're tired. And, and Meredith didn't even make it, so. <laughs> but um, Ava had a wonderful week. I think all the youth had an amazing week, so we're so thankful for that. So at this time, I would like to invite Dr. Sansbury to come forward and lead us in a short congregational meeting. It's good to be with you again in worship always. Uh, as you know, uh, I was married right here and uh, still remember the Christmas tree right there. And uh, this has always been a special place in my life and in ministry. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with you. But you do have this matter of uh, church business before you uh, as appropriately called for this day. Let us begin our congregational meeting with prayer. Gracious and holy God, you lead your people in worship, in ministry, and in service. We pray to know your presence with us this day in all that we say and do. Guide this congregation, we pray now, and in the months to come, make all the decisions and take all the actions that are right in your perfect will. We give all the honor, glory, and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we gather, in whose name we pray. Amen. We do have a quorum of members present to transact our business. I will at this time call on our clerk of session, Kathy Chapman, please, to uh, present the information and the motion. As you know, Dr. Steve Fitzgerald submitted his resignation to the session in a call meeting on July the 10th, 2022. Steve feels that God is calling him to move into a full-time interim ministry and he's taken a call within one hour of his grandchildren. So on behalf of the session, I make the motion that the congregation concur with the request to dissolve his pastoral relationship with First Presbyterian Church Sherall as of August the 21st, 2022. Motion is made, it comes from the session, does not require a second. You won't always pause and give opportunity in case of any questions to clarify. Seeing none, I ask that we proceed to a vote. All in favor of the motion as presented, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. This is the only item of business for which the session has called this congregational meeting. Let us close our meeting with a word of prayer. Gracious God, again we ask that you lead us, inspire us, renew us to love, honor, and serve Jesus Christ and love, honor, and serve one another. To the glory of your name, amen.
stand and join me in our responsive call to worship. <clears throat> oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for the Lord has done marvelous things. The Lord has made known his victory and revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. The Lord has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the people of God. All the ends of the earth shall see the victory of our God. Let us pray. Holy God, you are our faithful lover, our generous parent, our patient teacher, our constant friend. We live by the hope of your promises, seek to follow your way, and rely on the gift of your spirit by whose power we breathe and move and pray. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number 35, Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty. gathered in this holy place to adore and praise our loving almighty God. Yet if we say that we have not sinned, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, our Lord is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us together admit our need for God's gracious love to have his transforming way in us. Let us pray together. Gracious and almighty God, you call us into a life of faith and service, but sometimes we resist your call. You call us to a journey of faithfully trusting in you, but sometimes we hesitate to follow. You call us to become persons of gracious love toward everyone, but sometimes we love only a few. You call us to go here and do this, but we would rather go there and do that. Forgive us, Father God, for all the ways that we act as wayward children. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us anew today, so may we hear you, obey you, and follow your leading for our lives. We ask these things in the name of your obedient Son, 
Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, remember those words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We are the world for whom Christ came, Christ died, and Christ rose again. In Jesus Christ, we are God's forgiven people. And as a people, let us stand and greet and share in our holy interruption as we welcome one another to worship this day.
Oh God, as we open the scriptures this day, we pray that the spirit which inspired these words has sustained these words and preserved them for us over the centuries will now speak to us and through us. May we hear words that lead us to follow you more faithfully in all that we say and do. Amen. I'm going to read these two brief passages from the letter, which is really a sermon to the Hebrews, and then I will be approaching the Genesis passage a little differently, as will make sense in just a few moments. Hebrews 11, the first three verses, and then a couple verses from Hebrews 12. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. And from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. During my interim year with you, I took part in this church's mission trip to Virginia. In fact, a couple of us were remembering an aspect of that trip just a few moments ago. That week of our mission trip, we were once again based at the Massanetta Conference Center near Harrisonburg, Virginia. I had actually been to Massanetta some years ago in order to attend an evangelism conference there. I still remember how during our one free afternoon during the week of the conference, I drove farther up Interstate 81. Civil War buff that I am, I wanted to see the New Market battlefield just north of Massanetta. Unique to that battle was the role of 200 cadets from Virginia Military Institute. Most of them were only in their teens. There's quite an impressive museum at New Market. The entire Civil War is on display by means of wide, large panels showing scenes from major battles. There are scenes from Fort Sumter and Appomattox, Chancellorsville and Ch Chickamauga, Shiloh and Spotsylvania. Today, I think we here are a lot like museum visitors viewing those battle scenes. We are not, however, looking at battle scenes from the Civil War. Instead, we are looking at scenes from Abraham's own battle, his struggle to believe in God. There are three distinct scenes in this narrative. Each scene has a call to Abraham and Abraham's faithful response. I want you to consider each scene with me as we view this panorama of Abraham's battle to believe. Genesis chapter 22, scene 1. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. Author Scott Peck in his famous book, The Road Less Traveled, opened his book with three simple words. Life is difficult. Shirley Peck is not the first or only person to say those words. 
life is difficult. And yet he goes on to say that facing and conquering problems is the key to mental health. The sooner that is recognized and accepted, the healthier you will be. Not facing up to life's problems causes great distress, even illness. And I think it is the same with many other aspects of our lives. To paraphrase Peck, parenting is difficult. Being a Christian is difficult. Praying for God to bless those who have hurt you is difficult. Coping with mass shootings at schools and July 4 parades is difficult. Becoming like Jesus is really difficult. Problems of sin and guilt, doubt and shame, bad habits or worse addictions must be faced to be overcome. Avoiding the inevitable conflicts of family and career only makes those problems worse. I believe Abraham would agree with me on all of this. Abraham, after all, has already faced many problems. Abraham followed God's call when he left his ancestral home near Ur in modern-day Iraq. God commanded him to keep moving farther west until he reached Canaan. Abraham did that. Then the property on which he had settled had to be divided between his nephew Lot and himself. Lot took the best portion of the land. Abraham got the inferior land. Later, while in Egypt, Abraham lied about his wife Sarah's identity out of fear of the Pharaoh. That caused a physical illness for the Egyptians. It caused strife between Abraham and God, and it didn't really help his marital relationship either. When we meet Abraham again in this chapter, we see him with far fewer family ties. He has fewer connections to his past. Like some of us, Abraham was always missing family reunions. He was among the last to get the family news about cousin Becky getting married again. He was the last to hear that Uncle Bill's cancer had returned. His was the life of a wandering shepherd. He traveled up and down the hills of Canaan in search of grazing land for his flocks and in search of God's purpose for his life. Now God comes to Abraham and says to him, to sacrifice his only son Isaac. He's already given up his past. Now God is asking him to give up his future too. How can Abraham give up his son? How can he give up all his dreams for his son's life? How can he give up teaching his son to throw a ball or to catch a fish? How can he give up bedtime talks and prayers and wrestling on the floor of the den and soccer games on Saturday mornings? How can he give up dreams for his son's future success and his own hope for grandchildren? Didn't God promise all of that to Abraham? Does God keep God's promises? If Abraham were to give up his future as completely as he had given up his past, how could he then live? And yet that is what God asks him to do when God asks him to give up his son. I would have understood if Abraham balked at this command, just held up his hands and declared, God, you ask too much, find someone else. God, for God's own good purpose, chose to test Abraham this way. What does that say about God? What does that say about Abraham? What does that say about our own tests of faith? We move on to scene 2. Genesis 22, verse 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. 
In this second scene, the question to Abraham does not come from God. The question comes from his young son, Isaac. Isaac carries the wood. Abraham carries the fire and the knife. Abraham carries the dangerous things. Did you notice that? Father and son walk up the mountain mostly in silence as each one is lost in his own thoughts. Then Isaac breaks the silence. Father, he asks, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? At this point, I believe Abraham answers with a choked up voice and tear-filled eyes. All Abraham manages to stammer out is God will provide. That's what fathers are supposed to say, isn't it? I mean, when you can't answer your child's or your grandchild's question, don't you say something pious like, God will provide? Children ask things like, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God make people in different colors? Why doesn't Nick have to wear shoes? That one comes to you midwinter when Nick goes to school without wearing shoes because his parents neglect him. At such times, we parents tend to mumble cliched answers like God will provide. Then we change the subject quickly. We say other parenting things like finish your milk, the school bus is almost here. We breathe a sigh of relief that we escape further scrutiny on that tough question. Yet beneath our cool exterior, a whole raft of questions are boiling up within us. Will Abraham be able to put his own son on the altar? Will his father actually bring down the knife on the son? Is his God no different from other gods who demand human sacrifices? What could he possibly tell Sarah, the boy's mother, when he gets back home after doing what he's about to do? Can he ever go home again? Most importantly, does God know what God is doing? So Abraham continues trudging up Mount Moriah by faith. He sometimes, uh, somehow believes in this God who gave him this promised son so late in his life. Many lesser men or women would have turned around and gone back down the mountain, if not turned away from God altogether. But not so Abraham. He continues to believe, even though he is not sure why. And this, I think, is the place where we begin to enter Abraham's story. Many of us struggle with situations where God invites us to believe, to trust even though we cannot see the results of our belief. Trusting God without final, convincing, absolute proof, going where God wants us to go without a map, is getting harder and harder to do. The fears and anxieties all around us rob us of God's peace. Who knows how high gas prices will go? Is our country on the right track or not? What will the November elections bring? Can you explain what happened in a Texas elementary school a few weeks ago? Can you explain what happened at the Highland Park Parade on July 4? We want things simple, clear, settled. It's hard to trust God beyond what we can see. Will we continue to trust God and climb the mountain with Abraham? Or will we demand answers from God before we take another step? Some years ago, I corresponded several times with a woman in New York. She occasionally worshipped with us in Chattanooga, where I was then a pastor. She did that when she visited her daughter, who lived near our church. This woman usually wrote to say a brief thanks for a copy of the sermon I had sent to her. One time, though, she made an interesting comment about her own daughter. She wrote, My daughter is quite happy being a fundamentalist free Methodist after years in the Presbyterian Church, which is more challenging than she wants. She's like most American Christians who flock to those vast churches and feel secure with simple answers. She doesn't want to think about anything other than what she has learned long ago. I think a lot of people are longing for simple answers to life's tough questions. This woman's daughter is not alone. She sounds like that seeker after truth described in a Stephen Crane poem. 
Over a century ago, Crane wrote, the wayfarer perceiving the pathway to truth was, stuck, was struck with astonishment. It was thickly grown with weeds. Ha, he said, I see that no one has passed here in a long time. Later he saw that each weed was a singular knife. Well, he mumbled at last, doubtless there are other roads. Not so for Abraham. There are no other roads for Abraham except the road of faith. Abraham believes that God's truth for his life awaits him up atop the mountain. God has not failed to provide for him yet. On that basis, he continues his upward climb. But what kind of truth is it to sacrifice your own son? God will provide, Abraham tells Isaac. Abraham hopes to God. That is true. The third scene. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be. Provided. Abraham, so much like that centurion commended by Jesus, remember how the centurion's servant was ill? So he asks Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus agrees by saying, I will go and heal him. The centurion replies, Lord, you don't need to come. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority and I have soldiers under authority. I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, do this, he does it. Just speak, Lord, and my servant will be made well. Amazed, Jesus says, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Abraham and the centurion were willing to trust their lives and their sons and servants' lives totally to God. Yet nowhere in these scenes are there any easy answers to the hard question, why does God test Abraham this way? It seems hard and cruel to ask an aged father to give up his only son just to prove a point. Surely the intended result can be gained another way. Yet it all has something to do with showing that nothing and no one are more important to Abraham than faith in God. What, after all, did Abraham find at the top of the mountain? He found a ram there that could be sacrificed in place of his son. It was the late Catherine Marshall who understood this story better than any of our biblical scholars. It was Marshall who pointed out how Abraham was marching on the other side of the mountain, not understanding, but marching anyway. At the same time, the ram was wandering up the other side. The ram was searching for food and his horns got caught in the thicket. God did provide for the sacrifice as God promised. Abraham then gave that mountain place the name the Lord will provide. In Hebrew it means that God has seen Abraham during his test and has seen fit to provide. Abraham could see only one side of the mountain. God, however, could see both sides of the mountain. Most of the time, you and I go through our lives seeing only one side of the mountain. There are very few times when we actually see both sides. God, though, always sees both sides. We don't know, unless we keep going on our journey, what the other side looks like. We keep going by faith. Faith in God, as Hebrews says, really is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not yet seen. 
Abraham could not know for sure how God would resolve things. He believed that God would resolve them and resolve them in a good way. You and I, wherever we are in our various tests and trials, are walking up only one side of the mountain. We trust in our loving God who sees both sides. That is, after all, what the word providence means. It means that God sees and God provides. This may... Joy and I visited our son and his family in Walpole, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. We learned much more about our severely handicapped grandson, Henry, now 11 months old. And yes, he was named for his great-grandfather. And yes, you have prayed for him, and I thank you for your prayers. But on that particular weekend we visited, his nurses were able to come couple of nights and days for various reasons, our help was needed even more. On Saturday morning of that weekend, we decided to go to a nearby park for families with young children. Because of everything going on that morning, we were really slow in getting our stuff into two vehicles. We were late in getting to the park. Also, we had taken some of our South Carolina heat with us that weekend. It was pretty hot by the time we got to the park. We weren't there long before the alarm went off on Henry's portable ventilator. And at that moment, an amazing thing happened. A young mother came up and introduced herself to us as Vanessa. She said, I recognize the sound of that alarm. We have one just like it. When my two-year-old twin girls were born, I was told that one of them would never walk or talk. Now you can see her playing with her sister. I hope I'm not being forward, she said, but I wanted to let you know of some resources and some help I have found in the Boston area for caring for such a handicapped child. And then she swapped contact information with my daughter-in-law. They texted each other several times that day and many times since. Before we left the park, I went up to Vanessa and I said, you cannot know what a godsend you are for my family. Thank you. And I thought to myself how, if we had gotten to the park earlier, as we planned to do, if we had been on time, and Sandsbury's are never late, we would have, we would have missed meeting Vanessa. We would have missed her encouragement to us. Those years ago when I visited Newmarket Battlefield, it was not enough for me just to see the pictures in the museum. I had to get out and walk on the battlefield even as a huge thunderstorm was rapidly approaching. Well, so it is with us today. We cannot just look at the scenes in Abraham's test and then go home unchanged. We have to step out on the battlefield of faith itself. We must ask, is there anything more important in my life than faith in Jesus Christ? Is there any treasure, any person, any possession, any goal, any ambition, any habit, any trophy, anything at all more precious to me than faith in Jesus Christ? Struggling to answer that question is our battle today. So let us do more than review the scenes of someone else's struggle. Let us do more than praise the courageous faith of Abraham. Let us also step out on faith, walk in faith, follow in faith, wherever God leads. This difficult Genesis passage affirms two seemingly contradictory realities. It says that God who tests us also provides for us. And God who provides for us also tests us. This passage also promises us that God the tester and God the provider is faithful. Whether you are experiencing God today more as the tester or God more as the provider, God is always faithful. God will always do what God said God would do. 
For every ounce of faithfulness in Abraham, there is a ton of faithfulness in God. I hope you will trust God like Abraham did. Keep walking, keep climbing, keep trusting. Every day you will find too that the journey of faith, the journey of faith is its own reward. Amen. We will stand now and sing all verses of hymn 829.
at this time continue our worship as we share in our morning offering. We who have received so much through Jesus Christ are invited to give generously and gratefully. We dedicate these gifts as we dedicate our lives anew to serving you, first, last, and always. Take our gifts, take our lives, and honor Jesus Christ. Build up your church, let your kingdom come closer into this time and place. We ask all these things through our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We come to that time in our service for our prayers of intercession and then the Lord's Prayer together. Please make note of the list of prayer concerns which are printed on the back of the bulletin. Let us be faithful people to pray for one another. If you take this list home, stick it in your Bible, put it on the refrigerator, whatever it takes. I would ask that we add, of course, uh, this war and struggle and suffering in Ukraine to our list. Uh, get a blue and yellow ribbon or whatever it takes to help us likewise remember to continue our prayers for this war that has gone on far too long. Also, given the action that the congregation took at the beginning of the worship service, we are obligating ourselves to be prayerful people. Let us pray for God's direction, God's inspiration. You have an interim pastor search committee elected. In time, as you know, there will be a search committee for your next installed pastor. But for all these upcoming events, and the reason why the message was the message it was today, we need to keep walking and climbing and trusting and going, for our gracious God does have a great plan for us. And God does see both sides of the mountain. And God will lead us to where God wants us to be. Let us pray together.
Let us hear the words of our Lord Jesus when he says to his disciples, Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Gracious God, some of us this day are carrying heavy burdens, and this church together has the burden, the concern, the responsibility to go through a search process which begins now. Some of us are carrying burdens of concern for loved ones and friends who may be coping with cancer or recent griefs and losses or COVID or some other illness. Send your spirit as a healing presence into our lives and a guiding presence for our church. We pray for our Presbyterian Church and the just completed General Assembly meeting. We pray to grow in faith and witness and love for you and love for one another across our Presbytery Senate and General Assembly. We pray for the Reverend Gavin Meek, our Executive Presbyter, and pray for him and the 65 churches of New Harmony Presbytery. Take us and use us, O God, to give positive witness for Jesus Christ. We pray for our nation in a stressful time when it seems that everyone is pulled into the far left or the far right. Instead, O oh God, you call us to love you and love our neighbors as ourselves. And that surely includes those with whom we might disagree. Use us, God. Help us to grow as disciples, learning Help us to grow as apostles sent out to share the gracious love of Jesus Christ and the good news of his gospel. We ask all these things as we ask you now to be present with us, even as we offer the prayer you've taught your disciples then and now to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We stand and sing our closing hymn.
sisters in Christ, for that is indeed who we are, continue to trust, to follow, to climb, to go wherever our Lord is calling you to go. And this is so for us individually and together as a congregation. And as you follow our Lord Jesus Christ, may his richest blessings of love, grace, joy, and peace be poured out upon you, now and always. Amen. <laughs>